and welcome to UC Berkeley's scoping session for the university's long range development plan environmental impact report. My name is Kyle Gibson and I'm the director of communications for UC Berkeley Capital Strategies. Capital Strategies brings planning, design, real estate and construction services to the UC Berkeley campus. We're architects, planners, engineers, construction specialists and administrative personnel, all of whom work together to serve the campus community. I'm joined tonight by two members of our physical and environmental planning staff, senior planner Raphael uh, Brynas and assistant planner Timothy Green. The UC Berkeley campus is proactively engaging in planning around the COVID-19 outbreak in collaboration with our public health partners and the UC Office of the President. We are operating in accordance with all public health directives and applicable orders regarding the public health emergency. Of direct relevance to CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, on March 24th, 2020, five days after issuance of Governor Newsom's Safer at Home, Stay at Home order, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research announced that at this time, there has been no change to the deadlines, noticing, or filing requirements contained within CEQA. UC Berkeley is operating in compliance with that directive and will continue to closely track any CEQA related developments that may affect our ongoing projects, including those currently under environmental review. In light of these guidelines and the restrictions placed on in-person gatherings throughout the state of California, tonight we are hosting an online public scoping session rather than an in-person event. The purpose of a scoping session is to help notify the public that a lead agency, in this case UC Berkeley, is evaluating a project under the California Environmental Quality Act commonly referred to as CEQA, and to solicit public comment regarding the type and extent of the environmental analyses to be undertaken. The procedures for tonight's online scoping session are as follows. After a brief presentation that provides an overview of the proposed projects, we will read aloud public comments that were submitted to us by email following the instructions in the notice of preparation that was issued on April 7, 2020. The comments we read aloud will become part of the public. All comments received by the deadline in the notice of preparation will become part of the public record, not just the comments for us to read aloud tonight. The deadline to submit comments as stated in the notice of preparation is five o'clock PM on May 15, 2020. You can submit comments to us by emailing planning at berkeley.edu or by US mail to the address that you will be provided in tonight's presentation. Please remember that all comments submitted will become part of the public record and will be responded to formally as required by CEQA. I want to highlight that a public scoping session, whether held in person or virtually online, is not a question and answer session. All comments received, whether to be read aloud tonight or in writing by email or US mail, will be considered in preparation of the draft environmental impact report anticipated to be released in early 2021. Tonight is not the only opportunity for public comment during the preparation of the environmental impact report. Following the notice of preparation scoping period, the campus will prepare a draft environmental impact report that will be circulated for, at minimum, a 45 day review and public comment period. The campus will hold a second public meeting during that time to further solicit public comment on the draft environmental impact report. Now, I would like to introduce Rafael to give the brief presentation about the proposed projects and SQL analysis and process. Rafael. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Rafael Brynas. I'm a senior planner in physical environmental planning for the university. I would like to acknowledge the current unusual circumstances we are in this evening because of the COVID-19 pandemic and that the university has made every effort to quickly pivot to this new platform for the scoping meeting. Thank you for your patience and flexibility as we all adapt to the current conditions. I hope everyone is comfortable as, they, as we shelter in place. The university has put a tremendous effort into making the evening valuable to the public. And I'd like to stress your participation has been and will continue to be paramount to making this project successful.
This evening's scoping meeting has three parts. One, to present background and components of the land long range development plan update or LRDP update. Two, to provide an overview of the California Environmental Quality Act or as Kyle put it, uh, it's commonly referred to as CEQA. And three, to read comments that were received by 5 p.m. this afternoon. This virtual meeting is taking the place of a typical in-person scoping meeting. However, like all scoping meetings, its purpose is to collect input on the content of the environmental impact report, also known as an EIR. More specifically, its purpose is to receive comments on a range of alternatives and technical analysis that should be analyzed in the draft EIR anticipated to be released in early 2021. Comments are most helpful when they focus on the potential environmental impacts of the proposed project, whether they are indirect or direct impacts. This scoping meeting is required because the project meets the CEQA requirement for being of regional significance. While this is a live presentation, there is no ability to have interaction with the public. But all comments received by the end of business on Friday, May 15, 2020, will be tracked and included in the EIR and will be considered equally. And as Kyle noted, tonight is not the only time to provide comments. I will, I will discuss the EIR process and schedule later in the presentation, but there are future opportunities patient and input. We are at the beginning of the EIR process and it is anticipated to last another 15 months. The university's current long-range development plan was approved in 2005. An update is needed to align the LRDP with the university's current priorities to meet the needs of its students and research enterprise as a modern 21st century public institution of higher education. The UC regions require every UC campus to have and periodically update an LRDP. While the UC regions determine enrollment for each campus, the LRDP is a guide for planning the physical campus based on population projections. It is a framework which provides structure and order for the planning of future projects, but does not commit the university to, to specific individual projects. The university kicked off updating its long range development plan and campus master plan initiative over a year ago. This is a three year process that involves input and engagement throughout and is guided by the following goals. One, to inform and update the campus and community on the LRDP process and clearly communicate the project's information to the community. Two, to promote an inclusive environment and open discussion. And three, facilitate and encourage ongoing participation. To this end, the university has held more than 200 internal and external events and meetings engaging stakeholders associated with the LRDP. The university has held multiple open houses and at least one major engagement opportunity during each semester since the spring of 2019, including town halls, tabling on campus, and workshops for the campus community, as well as maintaining a website. Governance of the LRDP and campus master plan initiatives is overseen by an advisory group comprised of senior, senior campus leadership and a working group with representatives from various campus groups, students and faculty that were appointed by the chancellor. Furthermore, the university established a community advisory group or CAG. The CAG includes representatives from a wide variety of perspectives, including government, the nonprofit business sector, education, the arts and culture community and students and alumni leaders. The CAG kicked off with quarterly meetings in October, 2019 and will continue to meet until the LRDB is approved. UC Berkeley has also been meeting on a quarterly basis with the City of Berkeley leadership, including staff, council members with districts bordering the campus, and the mayor. And finally, the university formed subject-specific work groups consisting of designated campus stakeholders with technical expertise representing diverse perspectives that provide insight on important issues such as academic and research needs, housing, transportation, and infrastructure. The university will continue to engage stakeholders at, and the public at key LRDP update and CEQA milestones. The LRDP planning area includes all university owned property within the city of Berkeley, as well as university property on the Hill Campus to the east that is located within the city of Oakland. You can see Insets to this graphic that show satellite properties within Berkeley to the west and south. Hopefully you can see my cursor, which is a hand 
Uh, the insets include a property on 4th Street, on West Berkeley, and then in South Berkeley on Carlton, uh, 2000 Carlton, as well as uh, property on Telegraph Avenue. Uh, so we refer to the main campus as the campus park. And this is uh, roughly 180, 180 acres defined by Hearst Avenue to the north, Gailey Piedmont to the east, Bancroft to the south, and Oxford Fulton to the west. The Hill campus is to the east of Memorial Stadium and comprises roughly 800 acres, uh, mostly located in the city of Oakland, uh, Peak Boulevard to the east. It does not include 200 acres uh, managed by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is shown in this area. To south of campus is the 50 acre Clark Kirk campus and Smythe Fernwell properties. The EIR study area is the same as the long range development planning area. Planning horizons for long range development plans typically cover a timeline or forecast of 15 to 20 years. The project will extend the planning horizon forward to the 2036 37 academic year. This date was chosen because it is 15 years from 20, 2021 when the LRDP will be considered for approval. So you can see on this graphic uh, what the population projections are for 2036-37 academic year. Uh, we have 48,200 students and 19,000 faculty and staff. Uh, in terms of space and beds in 2036-37, uh, we could potentially add up to 11,700 new student housing beds, add up to 360 new employee housing units, and add up uh, just over 4 million gross square feet of academic and campus life facilities. A substantial portion of the overall development program is needed to meet the needs of the current campus population. Population assumptions included in the LRDP update provide a foundation for understanding the campus's long-term space needs. The assumptions represent the estimation of reason, reasonably foreseeable development that could occur through the 2037 and are used as the basis for the EIR's environmental assessment. So let's look closer at the numbers. You can see on this graph, uh, this table, and I'm reading uh, along the rows, we have students, employees as population groups. In 2005, the long range development plan was prepared. It projected in 2020 that there'd be 33,450 students. Currently, or at least in 2018, 29, there were 39,708 students. And this, uh, long range development plan projects in 2036 37 up to 48,200 students on campus, which is an increase of 8,492 from what was on campus uh, in 2018 2019. And this number was uh, developed by uh, averaging a half a percent of year uh, student increase for years one through five. And then for the following years, there would be a 1% increase. Uh, for students. For employees, reading across uh, the LRDP in 2005 projected 15,810 employees, both faculty and staff on campus uh, this year. In 2018-29, there was actually fewer with 15,421. In 2036-37, we're projecting 19,000 faculty and staff for an increase of 3,579 from 27, from 2018, 2019. And those numbers were dev uh, developed by um, uh, having a one to 18 faculty to student ratio, and then increasing the staff uh, proportional to what it is now. So what you can see on the bottom row, this equals uh, a 1.1% is the projected annual compounded campus population growth and uh, potentially up to 67,200 
uh, people uh, population on campus, which is an increase of 12,071 from 2018-2019. Looking further at the numbers, this is um, related to the space proposed as, uh, for the LRDP update. The middle column, the total academic and campus life space, uh, shows the space needs. The university now has just over 13 million gross square feet of academic and support space such as campus life facilities, which includes the entire UC Berkeley space inventory, except for housing and parking. More than 1.3 million gross square feet of space is needed to meet the needs of the current campus population and almost 2.7 gross square feet is needed to meet the needs of the current campus population uh, is projected, uh, excuse me, and 2.7 million gross square feet is projected to be needed for uh, in 2036-37 for a total of just over 4 million gross square feet of new net space under the LRDP update. And you can see that here. The far right column shows university beds. The university currently has approximately 9,500 beds in its inventory. The current housing deficit reflects the chancellor's recent to provide approximately 8,000 new student beds and 300 faculty units, which would increase the percentage of students housed to 45% from about 23% today. The space analysis for the LRDP assumes that the campus would expect to house a similar percentage of its future student body, and applying this percentage to the future student population generates the need for 3,350 additional student beds and three. 360 additional faculty units. While the new LRDP would enable the campus to develop new housing in terms of land use and environmental planning, development of future housing is contingent on a continuous assessment of housing demand, market conditions, and financial capacity. I want to repeat the point that a substantial proportion of the overall development program is needed to meet the needs of the current campus population. Uh, summarizing the numbers, Uh, we can see that in 2036-37, there uh, could be at full build out uh, 17 million gross square feet of academic and campus life space, which is an increase of just over 4 million from 2018-2019. Housing, there could be up to 21,200 university beds, which is an increase of 11,300 student beds and 360 faculty beds from 2018-2019. <clears throat> and we're still, um, we're still in the process of, of analyzing parking demand. So those numbers are not yet, haven't yet been determined. This graphic shows uh, potential growth areas and it includes the campus park as we talked about earlier. Uh, minor development of the Hill campus, development of the Clark Kirk campus, and satellite properties within the city of Berkeley. In terms of land use categories, the long-range development, development plan des describes the areas which could support potential growth in two main categories, academic research and support, which includes campus life facilities. The majority of identified program needs in this category will be accommodated on the campus park. The intention of the LRDP update and campus master plan is to make more efficient use of existing sites and preserve the existing proportion of open space within the campus park. The second land use category is mixed use other programs, which includes housing. And that will need to be accommodated outside campus park sites. Some academic research and support uses that do not require proximity to the campus park will also be accommodated in this category. Specific program locations will be prioritized based on the need for proximity to the campus park. The university is also analyzing sites both within the campus park and outside to provide additional parking. The Hill campus would have limited development focused primarily on expansion and renewal of existing academic research and public facing uses. The remaining Hill campus area comprising the majority of its acreage is proposed to continue to be used for purposes of recreation 
and manage for a while to reduce the flight process. This graph graphic focuses on potential housing development, which comprises approximately 35 to 55 acres. This graphic identifies potential housing sites under consideration to achieve the university's substantial housing goals within the mixed use category. Student and faculty housing is not proposed on the campus park or Hill campus. Some of the identified housing sites involve redevelopment and renewal of existing facilities. So to understand this graphic, uh, the purple dots are master lease sites. These are sites uh, privately owned that are leased by the university for students. The darker blue dots show co-op housing on the south side and the north. The lighter blue show uh, Greek housing uh, on the south side. And existing student housing is shown in the darker orange. So these uh, housing here on the south side and on the east. And then in orange, in the shaded orange, there uh, are 13 potential housing sites, all like located on university property or shown. Uh, and these are numbered. Uh, I wanna point out that additional student and faculty housing is under consideration for the Clark Kirk campus here, number seven, and potentially for the Fernwell site, just to the north, in order to meet the university's housing goals, uh, as well as student life facilities support existing and new housing facilities. So this graphic shows how future housing sites are, sites are related to the campus park. Undergraduate housing would be prioritized for sites in closer proximity to the campus park, while graduate and faculty housing would be contemplated further from the campus park. This graphic includes housing projects one and two, which are shown here as number two here and number 10, uh, which are included in the LRDP EAR to be analyzed in specific projects because they would likely be some of the first projects developed under the LRDP update. Here's a, a blow up of housing project number one. This is a one acre site just west of the campus park referred to as the gateway site as it is a gateway to the main entrance of the campus park. Uh, the site is located west across, uh, across Oxford Street from the campus park and is bounded by Oxford Street University Avenue, Walnut Street, and Berkeley Way. Located in a, uh, this site's located in a pri priority development area within close proximity, proximity to shuttle, AC transit stops, bike share, and BART. This project proposes uh, uh, up to 850 student beds focused on transfer students, and as proposed would include ground floor retail and this project is now in design phase and is projected to open in the fall of 2024. Housing project number two uh, is located in the site known as People's Park. This is a 2.8 acre site located on the southwestern corner of the intersection of Bowditch Street and Hay Street. It's roughly two tenths of a mile south of the campus park. University housing would be geared towards lower division undergraduates with up to 1,200 beds. The proposal also includes a separate building of permanent supportive housing with up to 125 units to house the formerly homeless. And generous open space would be included. There is a design process going on currently for this site with information on UC Berkeley's capital strategies website. And similar to housing project number one, this project is in design phase and is projected to open fall 2024. So I'm moving on to CEQA. Uh, the purpose of this scoping meeting, as Kyle said at the outset, is to gather input on what should be evaluated in the EIR and an appropriate range of alternatives to analyze in the EIR. This is intended to be a robust process to ensure that both UC Berkeley stakeholders and their surrounding community have ample opportunity to not only review information relevant to the campus's work on the LRDP update, but to weigh in with meaningful participation. We are at the beginning of the CEQA and public processes, and in addition to tonight, there will be more opportunities for public involvement over the next 15 months. I will attempt to give you a, pri a brief primer on CEQA, which is the state's premier environmental protection and disclosure law. CEQA was, en was enacted in 1970 and requires public agencies to evaluate potential environmental effects of a project. 
The purpose of CEQA is A, to consider and disclose to the public and decision makers the environmental implications of their actions and increase public understanding of and participation in the environmental review process. And B, identifies ways to avoid or reduce the potential significant environmental effects of these actions to the extent feasible through imposition of mitigation measures or alternatives. An important thing to consider is that CEQA requires an evaluation of a project's effect on the environment and not the environment's effect on the project. Uh, as Kyle noted at the outset, UC Berkeley is the lead agency responsible, responsible for preparing the environmental review for the project. Under CEQA, the lead agency is a public agency that has a primary responsibility for carrying out or approving the project. The university is both the project proponent and lead agency. The EIR must be certified before project approval. The UC regions would consider certification of the LRDP EIR and approval of the LRDP up. An environmental impact report is one of CEQA's mechanisms for identifying and disclosing potentially significant physical impacts of a project. An EIR is informational document that considers the environmental effects of a project. A project is typically a specific development like a hotel or shopping center. But in this case, the LRDP update and its many components is the project. A project defined by CEQA generally has two components. One, an activity that requires a discretionary action by the lead agency, such as an approval. And two, uh, an action that will have a direct or indirect impact on the environment. In terms of EIR, CEQA includes different types for varying situations and intended uses. Uh, a program level EIR is appropriate for broad planning actions such as the LRDP and can be used to tier CEQA review for future development projects. Project level EIRs are appropriate for specific uh, development projects. Because the proposed project includes both long range plans and the construction and operation of two specific housing projects, this LRDP EIR is considered a program EIR that will include both program level analysis for the proposed long-term policy document and project level analysis for the construction and the operational phases of houses, housing projects one and two. This LRDP update program EIR, EIR will analyze a series of action characterized as one large project that may be implemented by the university over many years. Among various advantages of preparing a program EIR is that it's helpful in dealing with subsequent activities. The goal is to prepare an EIR that analyzes the outer limits of any associated environmental impacts from physical planning so that many subsequent activities could be found to be within the scope of the project described in the program EIR, which would allow for subsequent future environmental documentation to be streamlined. The EIR will include an evaluation of all the applicable applicable topics identified in Appendix G of the CEQA guidelines that are shown on the slide. As included in the notice of preparation, a preliminary study determined that certain issues where there is no potential for impacts would not be further evaluated the LRDP EIR. However, the scoping period is intended to solicit comments regarding the scope of environmental analysis. So this is subject to change. We are at the beginning of the EIR process. The university kicked off the CEQA process three months ago by hiring an environmental consulting firm, and it's anticipated to be an 18 month process. Uh, so far, we have uh, published a notice of preparation and distributed that. And tonight, obviously, we're at the scoping meeting, which is only focused on input on the scope of the EIR and not input on the project. Notice of preparation published April 7th. We're in the scoping comment period, which runs from April 7th to May 15th. We anticipate publishing the draft EIR in the winter, the beginning of next year, winter 2021. There will be a comment period when the draft EIR is released, a minimum 45 days. We anticipate publishing the final EIR with responses to comments in the spring of next year. And then finally, uh, consideration of the final uh, EIR and adoption, uh, approving of the long range development plan by the UC Regents uh, next summer, 2021. Uh, future 
opportunities to provide input include during the draft EIR. We'll publish a notice of availability with the release of the EIR. And then uh, at the end during approval, there'll be meetings to consider certification of the EIR and approval of the long range development plan. At the beginning of this presentation, I stated that the LRDP initiative is guided by informing the public and encouraging public participation. The university has followed and exceeded the recent gover governor's order pertaining to noticing under CEQA during the shelter in place. The university has pursued additional methods of public notice and out outreach as appropriate for this significant project. The university anticipates the, uh, that future planning meetings will be in person, but we will continue to go to notify the public by multiple means to ensure the public is up to date on this process. So please check back on the university's capital strategies website for updates to the LRDP update and the LRDP update EIR. Again, the purpose of this evening is to solicit community input and environmental issues to be studied in the EIR. All comments are an important part of either the planning or environmental review process. Based on scoping comments, the university may adjust the scope of the EIR as necessary. All comments will be tracked and included in the draft EIR. After tonight, we'll continue to receive public comments through May 15th on uh, technical issues to address in the EIR and appropriate range of alternatives to evaluate in the EIR. Comments are most helpful when they focus on the potential environmental impacts of the proposed project. And as Kyle uh, said at the outset, uh, comments are due May 15th. Written comments can be mailed to myself at the address here. Email comments anytime through May 15th, end of the day, can be emailed to planning at berkeley.edu. And now I'll turn the presentation back to Kyle, who will provide details about public comment. Thanks, Raphael. Uh, so in a moment, in reading aloud public comments submitted for tonight's online scoping session, these comments were submitted by the public according to the directions in the notice of preparation. Those directions specified to email comments to planning at berkeley.edu by five o'clock p.m. tonight uh, to include their full name and to state that UC Berkeley has permission to read their comments aloud. The notice also specified that depending on the number of emailed comments received, we would be able to read comments submitted up to 500 words. Again, I want to highlight that all comments received, whether to be read aloud tonight or in writing by email or US mail before the May 15 deadline will be responded to equally as required by the California Environmental Quality Act. There is no additional weight given to comments we read aloud tonight. Please remember the deadline for written comments is May 15, 2020 at five o'clock p.m. So at this time, uh, Timothy, Raphael, and I will read aloud public comments submitted for tonight's online scoping session. And uh, Timothy, I'll turn it over to you to read the first batch of comments. Okay. Comment number one is from Gordon Burns. I am fully in support of building new housing. Housing project one and housing project two sound great. I would support even more housing. I would support the, co the college adding 30,000 new units for undergraduate and graduate students. I love that the projects are mixed use with amenities on bottom. I love that there's going to be services for our unhoused population and that there is also affordable housing for the community in general. This stuff is great. Please do more of it. And tell me when to show up at, uh, to yell at the city council to let you all do more of it. Number two from Alfred Twu. I'm glad to see that UC is planning to build more student housing, but 11,700 beds is not enough. Two years ago, the Housing Master Plan Task Force identified that 15,600 beds were needed and only 8,700 available for a shortage of 6,900 beds. The current EIR estimates 8,900 additional students a year. To house these students and make up the current 6,900 bed shortage, 15,800 beds are needed. We should not rely on private housing to make up this difference. Berkeley into the Bay Area as a whole also has a shortage of regular housing, especially since the plan also expects the number of faculty and staff 
to grow up from 15,400 to 19,000, while only providing 385 employee housing units. Let there be enough housing. Please plan for at least 15,800 student beds and 4,400 employee housing units. Number three from Sumaya Lamers. I was recently accepted into UC Berkeley and only days after committing, I heard about the university's plan to over People's Park to build student housing. I was honestly disgusted. My mother grew up in, Ber in Berkeley and I've spent a lot of time in the city. People's Park is home to a massive homeless community that are part of Berkeley culture and need a place to stay and to live together the way they want to on their own terms. Two of my uncles suffer from severe paranoid schizophrenia and lived homeless in Berkeley for years. One of the few places they felt safe was at People's Park. But People's Park isn't just a safe space for the homeless. It's also a historic Berkeley monument, home to protests and progress and free speech, a place where activists and students have pushed for a better future and, uh, and present and fought for the ideas and issues that mattered to them. It's more than a park, it's a picture, it's history, and UC Berkeley wants to bury it. One of Berkeley's biggest attractions is its spirit of activism, its reputation for being woke and promoting social progress, etc. And yet here it is pushing to remove one of the hearts of Berkeley, People's Park, to build overpriced student housing, housing that is not affordable or available to Berkeley citizens. It's ridiculous, it's hypocritical. You guys rec recognize the park's importance, its history, its significance to the Berkeley community, and you are choosing to ignore it and deface it. You are choosing a plan that will make you money over the spirit of Berkeley, your in institution. You are behaving like money-hungry colonists, sacrifice history, land, and spirit for power. Do not go through with this. Four, Sylvia Santillanes Robson. UCB should stop entering long-term public-private partnerships to build expense, expensive student housing. Public lands occupied places on unceded Chochenyo Ohlone territory are being given away to the corporate developers. Unfortunately, the capital strategies department has chosen to be an agent of modern colonialism, colonialism and a perpetrator of the housing crisis by aligning with the developers and the police who charge and enforce outrageous rents and carry out evictions. Project number two must be canceled. Student dormitories should not be built on People's Park. The vision for this land was already decided well before the first open house, and the vision has been to build. Community input has been equivalent to choosing bathroom tiles when they decided to build a house. The proposed project number one includes building retail space and commercial offices where they easily could put some of the planned low-income housing. They're only planning to put it on People's Park because they want to destroy in order to cloak themselves in the guise of social justice. They could have put affordable units at David Blackwell Hall, which was recently built by American Camp Communities, a for-profit corporation whose top five executives combined to make almost $12 million a year. But instead they gave ACC a 99 year ground lease to build upscale dorm rooms, which cost well over thousand dollars a month and ground floor retail space that ACC can profit from. Aligning with private developers will never alleviate the housing crisis because they are the ones who create it. There is a long and ongoing history of the collaboration of capital with the government for anti-poor, often anti-black slum programs, which destroy public space. See, for example, the book Yerba Buena, Land Grab and Community Resistance in San Francisco by former UC Berkeley faculty member, Chester Hartman. At best, such projects often replace community and community organizations with corporate funded nonprofits. One such organization appears to be RCD, who wants to build supportive housing units at People's Park. RCD's top five is Alameda County Sheriff's Office, the agency that carries out evictions, Union Bank, and Wells Fargo, who finances corporate developers, fossil fuels, private prisons, are implicated in redlining and racist housing practices, the 20 to 2008 financial crisis, et cetera and Home Depot. RCD's top five executives combined make almost 700,000 per year salaries, mostly by rent paid by the low income people living in their properties. 60% of RCD's revenue in 2017, according to IRS data. This is nothing out of the ordinary, but just an example of the crazy status quo system that exists today. UC Berkeley's capital strategy has chosen to align with it by filling this particular 
filing this particular EIR. Comment five, Lynn Sherrill. We are asking the university to postpone its presentation of its new development plan for two new student housing complexes until the community can participate and at least until the community input in person is received. It is presumptuous to push this through while most citizens are sheltered indoors. Number six, Daniela Thompson. It can be taken as a truism that UC Berkeley will always choose the most inappropriate and inconvenient time to release a notice of preparation involving a controversial development project. The current case is no exception. Who else would take advantage of community vulnerability to push its development agenda while a pandemic is raging on? No doubt UCB is aware that the California League of Cities on March 22nd, 2020 requested of Go Governor Newsom relief to expend a number of deadlines, including the deadline in the Permit Streamlining Act. Yet your notice of pre preparation released more than two weeks later cites the Permit Streamlining, Streamlining Act deadline is immutable. Further, more, the only public session allowing community members to speak would, via, would be via a live webcast on April 27th. Clearly a single two hour scoping session, which a good part would be taken up by UC's own presentation is grossly inefficient, insufficient for the community to express its views on a subject so complex. UCB must withdraw the notice of preparation for the duration of the current COVID-19 crisis. As for the proposed housing projects, both portend highly undesirable outcomes. Housing project number one will do away with the university garage. Walter H. Radcliffe, Jr. architect, built 1930, a city of Berkeley landmark. Housing project number two will be on People's Park, also a city of Berkeley landmark, and surrounded by 16 other designated city of Berkeley landmarks, constituting a de facto historic district. It's time for UC Berkeley to show us that it has a human side. Table the notice of preparation until the COVID-19 crisis is over. Comment number seven from Ben Eversoll. I am a student at Berkeley Law writing to express my strong support for the housing projects number one and number two described in the email sent to students on April 7, 2020. UC Berkeley is in desperate need of more student housing and these projects are the kinds of large scale projects that the school should be building every year. I support a focus on maximizing the number of units in the project built so as to maximize the benefit to students and increase the local supply of housing. I also strongly support the inclusion of supportive housing at housing project number two to provide assistance to Berkeley's homeless population. The current state of People's Park is untenable and cannot continue. The park operates an open air drug market that attracts drug dealers and violent criminals who prey on the local homeless population. Comment number eight from Shirley Dean. Concerns, one, this EIR process must be postponed until COVID-19 requirements are rescinded. We are all back to some normalcy when everyone can participate with no 500 word limits on comments. During this pandemic, people are distracted because of personal concerns associated with their daily lives. Concerns that range from worry about getting sick themselves, and taking care of partners, children, and elderly parents, keeping their businesses open, wondering whether they will have a job tomorrow, getting a paycheck, and how they will pay the rent and even get food on the table. Also, the NOP itself is not easy to find on either the president's office or UC Berkeley website. It's a complex issue and the notice provided only a short time to respond. Two, since UC Berkeley, A, admittedly cannot house a number of students, lowest number of student beds on any UC campus, and faculty it currently has, E, is located in a small 8.5 by 8.5 square miles, already dense built up community with no way to expand current boundaries. C is in a USGS identified earthquake zone, Alquis Perillo, that is overdue and predicted to be in line for major disastrous event. And additionally is an identified severe high five risk area and D pays little or nothing for the complete range of city services that are needed and provided to the camp. LRDP planning must begin from a position that fully describes these current conditions before it even begins discussing future growth. The above items are major considerations, not just mere amendments to the current LRDP that allows the establishment of a new baseline for future growth. Enrollment and related numbers have exceeded the present LRDP and how, when, and why that happened must be explained 
and in reaching agreement on a future LRDP, a mechanism must be included so that such major breaches cannot occur again. Four, any planning must specifically look at the amount of open space being planned for all new students, faculty, and staff. The south and west areas adjacent to and including the campus park itself are park poor for all our residents. Rooftop gardens and small balconies are simply not sufficient to provide the mental and physical benefits that open park space provide. Five, in establishing current and future enrollment and staff populations, the EIR must include consideration of mobile and stationary greenhouse gas emissions, energy, land use, and transportation of population increases for special events, including athletic, concert, lectures, and the like. The campus park is an esteemed academic and research facility, but it also provides an important social and intellectual function for the people of Berkeley and the whole state. This too must be recognized and appropriately considered. Comment number nine from Charles Siegel. The EIR for UC's long range development plan should study the impacts of making the block of Walnut Street between Berkeley Way and University Avenue into a pedestrian street as part of the Gateway Student Housing Project. There are obvious advantages to creating a pedestrian street here. It would provide open space for the residents of this dense housing and for others in downtown. It would improve downtown's economy by making downtown a more attractive destination. It would provide a possible new site for Brazil Cafe, which would be displaced by the Gateway Project. It would also give this area a character that is consistent with the pedestrian-oriented character of campus. It would be relatively inexpensive because the street will have to be rebuilt anyway after construction. UC has done similar things in this area by widening the sidewalk to Berkeley Way and by adding a pedestrian only Walnut Street between First Avenue and Berkeley Way. This block would be a continuation of that existing pedestrian only block of Walnut Street. To make it possible, the EIR should study the following impacts of making this block pedestrian only as part of its study of the impacts of the Gateway Project. Transportation. The change, would have to be, the change would have a minor impact on local traffic circulation. Since this is just a one block long street, the impact would be mitigated by providing access to the Gateway housing on Berkeley Way rather than on Walnut Street and possible by providing driveways on Walnut Street if needed. Aesthetics. There would obviously be a positive aesthetic impact, noise. There would be a positive impact reducing the noise for people who live in the gateway housing and in the ashes and commons project on the other side of walnut street recreation open space there would be a positive impact providing usable open space for the people living in the gateway project and for people in downtown generally i believe there would be strong support for pedestrianizing walnut street in the city of berkeley government so please study this possibility in the eir for the lrd Number 10, Christopher and Suzanne McKee. We believe that the housing crisis is one of the most important issues facing California. Berkeley should do its job in providing more housing, particularly for students. The campus's plans for providing more housing at People's Park and on Oxford Street are an important step in this direction. Number 11, Don Goldwasser. I am a Berkeley native and artist having sold my work in a gallery on 4th Street for many years, as well as at the Telegraph Street Fair. I have also authored and published books which chronicle Berkeley's history during the time when I was growing up there. I am writing you to voice my opinion that People's Park, a valuable green space, is an important historical landmark in Berkeley. For many non-Berkeley people that I have spoken with through the years, People's Park appears to be the only world famous landmark that Berkeley possesses. The history of People's Park also appears to be of the utmost importance for students at alumni of UC Berkeley. It is part of the fabric of their alma mater. And for the many people who have visited Berkeley as tourists, People's Park could be likened to other world famous landmarks throughout our country. From the, Hollywood, from the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Los Angeles to the Statue of Liberty in New York City, these sites carry a relevance which the passing of time has only proved to increase the value of ports of sentiment and rich local histories. Removing Berkeley's only world famous landmark in order to build yet another set of things in an era where zeal for development has often already overridden public concerns 
seems to be unnecessary and frankly, in my opinion, is in poor taste. Another concern in regards to the rapid increase in development is the green spaces. I agree that Berkeley's new face is coming along nicely and the downtown area now reminds one of modern day Santa Monica, but with one exception. Santa Monica has parks and green spaces alongside the entire beach. And the beach's quirky attraction is that it's still the artists, craftspeople, and street performers that fill the promenade and draw many tourists from around the world. It's the juxtaposition of modern buildings and clean streets meshing nicely with the ambiance of colorful humans and plenty of green spaces that make Santa Monica a premier neighborhood for both visitors and residents alike. Just modern buildings are not enough, and without an abundance of green spaces, Berkeley's south side neighborhood will just become a maze of large buildings. It will, in my opinion, lose all its charm, but will not be a pleasant place to visit or to live. I understand the desire to clean up and modernize the city of Berkeley and the UC. I do not understand nor approve of any plans that include destroying the only world famous landmark located there or the shrinking down of green spaces, which are increasingly important for the future ambiance of a town filled with large impressive modern buildings. Number 12, Zach Stewart. Many years ago, I was fortunate enough to be choosing to design Ho Chi Minh or Willard Park and Shorebird Park for the city of Berkeley. Since then, I have been amazed at the skill and dedication demonstrated by the Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront Department in maintaining all of Berkeley Parks, the Rose Garden, Civic Center Park, etc., for the 120,000 residents of Berkeley. The University of California shows similar capability regarding the university grounds for the total of 43,000 graduate and undergraduate students they serve. However, the, their indifferent maintenance of People's Park clearly shows that PRW would do a much better job. A brief look comparing People's Park to Fit Civic Center Park less than a mile away dramatically in, illustrates this. CC Park is trim, clean, and inviting, and is commonly enjoyed by picnicking families and other groups. People's Park has been allowed to devolve into little more than an eyesore, heavily frequented by indigents and petty criminals. The single difference between them is management and maintenance. UC has nine available housing sites. It makes sense for next week's EIR scoping to address a proposal that the university provides housing for their projected enrollment of more than 48,000 students on eight of these available sites and mitigate the impact on Berkeley's 120,000 residents by ceding ownership of People's Park to the city of Berkeley. If properly managed, this neglected park, surrounded by almost a dozen designated landmark buildings, would provide much needed open space for the entire population of the city, a miniature version of Olmsted Central Park in Manhattan. 13, Charles Wollenberg. A serious omission in UC Berkeley's proposal regarding the development of the People's Park site of a no-build alternative. CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, assumes consideration of alternatives that do not least do that do the least environmental harm. In this case, this would certainly be preservation and improvement of the only existing public open space in Berkeley's densely populated South Campus neighborhood. Instead, the university high-rise residency halls, including a 16-story building on the site. Certainly Berkeley, like the entire Bay Area, Bay Area, is in great need of affordable housing, but only the University of California plans to destroy a public park to create it. The university has identified several other potential sites for student and faculty housing. How in the spirit of CEQA can it justify the destruction of 2.8 acres of public open, open space? The People's Park District Advocacy Group proposes the preservation and improvement of the park, already a registered historical landmark as part of a historic district that includes 16 other registered historical landmarks that are in the immediate neighborhood. The district would commemorate the heritage of Berkeley's extraordinary role in the events of the 1960s, as well as the larger story of town gown relationships in the South Campus area. This would be consistent with the university's commitment to public service and provide significant educational and research opportunities based on programs of close community relationships and cooperation. A model for several programs is the native plant garden that once existed in the park. 
Perhaps the university and community could join in establishing a multidiscipline Bernard Maybick Town Gown Institute to sponsor and promote these efforts. The Institute would be named for the distinguished architect of the Christian Science Church that is the neighborhood's most famous architectural historic landmark. And the Institute might be located in the former Anna Head School, now a university property that is another historical landmark. And like the Christian Science, Science Church located across the street from the park. It is inconceivable that the university with its vast resources and talented students and faculty should not be able to create a public open space that welcomes students, neighborhood residents, and visitors without displacing the poor and the homeless. Accomplishing this would be a noble work of public service, education, and scholarship. We urge the university to join with the city and the South Campus community to preserve and promote People's Park as the heart and soul of a vital historic district. And I just wanna emphasize that was uh, letter 13 by Charles Wollenberg written on behalf of the People's Park Historic District Ad Advocacy Group. Letter 14, Jerry Holland. The university's current proposal for a 16 story housing complex in People's Park is misguided and detrimental to the immediate neighborhood as well as to the larger Berkeley community. The historic neighborhood encompasses many historic landmarks, including Berkeley's most famous, the Christian Science Church by Bernard Maybeck. This proposal overwhelms every building it is adjacent to, reflects none of the historic character of the surrounding building, and is out of context for the city of Berkeley. Your proposal is completely out of scale and insensitive to, the neighbor, to this neighborhood, and in its present form should be abandoned altogether. There are basic design and planning principles that need to be adhered to, starting with the university's own planning guidelines. The city too has guidelines for how to sensitively add new buildings to older neighborhoods. Furthermore, there are hundreds of talented planners, designers, and architects in our community and at the university that can do a much better job of integrating much needed student housing on the site. I strongly urge that you consult with them and discontinue this poorly thought out project that creates more problems than it solves. Letter 15, Charles Shear. If the present crisis being faced by the entire world teaches us nothing else, it teaches the dangers of population density, social inequality. That the course of empire has run to its end. The Athens of the West has sold off enough of her heritage, has too well neglected her history. The planned construction at People's Park shamelessly ignores good social practice by reaffirming the university's intent to impress far too many students in its ghetto. Even while the adapting methods, of, even while the adapting methods of higher education are questioning the utility of complexes of buildings, and while the social value and function of the university education are being questioned, the student population of UC Berkeley should be reduced. Merced, Riverside, and Santa Cruz campuses should take their share of the burden. But until we know how the economy, public transportation, the energy sector, and the very viable the very viability of our state of California can recover from this moment. Any commitment to a project like this is pure folly. Please stop it now. Comment number 16 from Edna Friedman. I have lived in Berkeley continuously since 1967. I am a graduate of Cal with a BA in history. I agree with the development concept. I am, however, shocked by the scale of the 16 story building. It is far too tall. It massively overshadows the historic buildings. It is completely out of scale with the surrounding blocks, commercial and residential. I could support a building of up to eight stories high. Comment 17, Gianna Renu Renuzzi on behalf of the LeConte Neighborhood Association. The LeConte neighborhood lies within the boundaries of Dwight Way, Telegraph Avenue, Shattuck Avenue, and the Oakland border. The area between the LeConte neighborhood and the southern edge of the UC campus is called the South Side. This EIR really should be three separate EIRs due to the complexity and intensity of impacts generated by each of these three projects, the LRDP update, Housing Project 1, and Housing Project 2. Nonetheless, this three-part EIR is being rushed through at a rapid pace and at a highly inappropriate time. The program LRDP update portion of this EIR is premature due to concurrency with the City of Berkeley Southside Zoning Ordinance Updates Project, which was recently under review until it was delayed due to the COVID-19 state of emergency declared by Governor Newsom 
which passed meetings by the relevant city commissions and boards. UC is also under the same state of emergency, but is inexplicably ignoring that fact with respect to this EIR. Density is one of the key discussions of the ongoing but on hold city review of the Southside Zoning Ordinance Updates Project. UC project number two is within the area under discussion for ordinance updates. Many factors that might possibly affect the discussion of density are in flux right now, again, due to the state of emergency. So it is hardly the time to rush through a project or projects for which prior beliefs about the need for escalating density may no longer apply. Significant need to provide more student housing at UC Berkeley mentioned in the notice of preparation is no longer a given. The USA Today article titled, Students are weary of online classes, but colleges can't say whether they'll open in fall 2020, puts a senior vice president for the American Council on Education, Terry Hartle, quote, the coronavirus will determine when colleges and universities can reopen. All colleges and universities want to open normally, but no college knows if it can, end quote. Under these circumstances, how can you see, assume that extreme density of student housing it has been promoting will be a good idea in the future. Finally, both the South Side and the LeConte neighborhood are severely lacking in open space. Prior to the state of emergency, extreme density requiring people to live in close proximity to one another was viewed as the most desirable land use possible. Will that trend continue? Perhaps carefully designed and well-managed open space will be seen as a necessary component of developments in the future. If UC miscalculates and spends precious resources on an EIR that is focused on the wrong questions, this would be a waste of California tax revenue. UC is a state entity and should be using its resources for the benefit of residents, California, not squandering them on a belief that trends of the last two decades will continue despite a changing Comment number 18 from Richard Marcus. I'm writing about the university's plans for developing the land called People's Park. I speak only about the argument that this open space is itself worthy of protection as historic and that this designation should limit development. I distinctly remember the events surrounding the controversy about the university's plans for this land in 1968-69. I dearly wish the brown shingle and other structures the university demolished then were still there. I was not there on the day Ben Siegel reportedly shouted something like, let's go take the park. But I was there regularly over the subsequent few years and thought it was a desirable park-like place. For years, I regarded it as somewhat sacred space, but I am not blind to what it has become in recent decades. It is not hallowed space anymore. To the contrary, to my mind, it has almost become an eyesore. And I suspect it is a place many citizens of the city consciously avoid. So I would argue against treating this place as entitled to a pedigree of protest now in the 21st century. Don't stay your hands on that ground. The design of the buildings does indeed look overbearing to me. I can't say I enthuse about seeing them in place, but I certainly will not mourn if something else is put there in place of what's been there for the last several decades. Number 19, Eric Hazlow. I fully support the proposed project. The current condition at People's Park is sad, a depressing use of urban space, at best a legacy to the failure of Berkeley's homeless policies. UC's proposed project will bring much needed student and support housing to Berkeley. It preserves open space and might even become an enjoyable community space. Number 20, Glenn Jarvis. One, this site is a city of Berkeley landmark and is surrounded by landmarked buildings to essentially make a landmarked district. This site has a significant history of the Berkeley community speaking out and acting to demand open space. Two, this is the only open space for many blocks in all directions in a dense residential neighborhood that needs more, not less usable open areas. Three, UC Berkeley should reevaluate the density of all new developments in light of our current coronavirus pandemic and social distancing as a public health requirement. Four, the UC Berkeley campus has more than a square mile of undeveloped land above the stadium, so there are alternate sites for UC housing. Five, 
Moving the hobos from this site will not make them go away, and they will still be camping on the same blocks. The finest public university in the world should be able to understand this and use their expertise to find real uh, Number 21, Stephen Bourne. People's Park is a national landmark and must be protected. The park must serve all of the residents of Berkeley as a vitally needed open space in a congested urban setting. The park can be improved in many ways and should be less hospitable to elements that make it undesirable for students and families with children. A lot can be accomplished with appropriate landscaping and removal of basketball. I am a native of Berkeley. I was present on the People's Park March. I live in the neighborhood. I have a degree from UCB. I am a UC professor emeritus, and I am adamantly opposed to current People's Park redevelopment plan. Stop. Consider this landmark seriously. I am also arrested on another march to save People's Park. 22, Maxina Ventura. Problem number one. This EIR would be used as an umbrella under which UC would pursue future projects, not just the who they name in this NOP. UC must not avoid doing environmental impact reports for each project as they try to jam through what the public may understand as destructive. UC is trying to allow meaningful input, which could result in stopping their plans or slowing down as each project is considered by all concerned and all who could be impacted. Reference to the more than 200 meetings with stakeholders would suggest meetings with developers or cherry picked people who for whatever personal reasons would prefer to see this beautiful park paved over and built upon. One LRDP town hall occurred on April 2019, but no others to my knowledge. Two people's park specific occurred earlier in 2020 and a small meeting of invited people involved with people's park met with capital strategies representatives and one nonprofit which would stand to benefit by lucrative contracts with the UC. This NOP is about future plans for the UC Berkeley as a whole, which own lands all over Berkeley. But there is a curious insistence on leveling this 2.8 acre park of trees, open space, and lungs of the neighborhood. A fallacy is the assumption that more students need to be added when the city already has sued UC over being nearly 10,000 over in 2019 for the 2020 LRP put out in 2005, close to 25% over the agreement. To plan for an additional 8,900 students and 3,600 faculty and staff when UC's action have resulted in more on the streets, including students, because of housing impacts due to such growth is reckless. To say it needs 4 million gross square feet of administrative and academic building is disingenuous. If so much administration is needed, perhaps the mission of learning is our last consideration. When I was at UC 40 years ago, there were not enough core classes. Less than a decade ago, UCB students crowded BCC, making an unjust situation for those without means to attend UCB. UC does not set a future population capacity for UCB, thereby leaving floodgates open. UCB must not pursue out of country or out of state students. Serve more California students, less negative impact to Berkeley and our whole region. East Bay Pesticide Alert addressed in past related comments what shows up here again as UC tries to designate Hill Campus and People's Park non-forest since they don't contain state or national forests. That is in, conf in conflict with USDA senior scientist David J. Nowak, who presented for UCB's 150th celebration lecture series on the crucial importance of urban forests. This month, People Worldwide celebrated three peregrine falcon chicks hatched on the Campanile. Their parents and hawks depend on tall trees at People's Park for resting and views during their food hunts. They need tall trees and open space, both of which the park offers not only people, but wildlife. Make no mistake, students in the long time Berkeley community loves People's Park. 23, Phil Allen. A number of considerations have come your way and your plans for developing People's Park. Some of them may concern my personal issue or stand, if you excuse the pun. Excuse the pun. I want more than due attention given to that remaining stand of trees populating the eastern area of the park. The recent obscene removal of close by healthy trees during quiet hours was typical of Cal's tactic of early morning traumatic rousting of people, property, or nature while neighbors slumber. For over 50 
fears the geographic appellation of park has been tenuously bestowed upon this property, given, given its multiple ownerships and tugs. Yet a park it has remained. In the presence of grand green bows overhead are both an essential reminder and a contributor to the very idea of what any park should be. In any case, it would be the apex of Orwellian doublethink to develop the park per its hopeful presentation by UC's planners and then give the result the name with park in it. 24, Frederica Drodos. The chancellor's vision is laudable one and contains many aspects worthy of support. Nevertheless, times have changed since this planning process began and the notion of a 16 story densely inhabited building where today an open block of land exists no longer seems like a vision worthy of pursuit. While I applaud the engagement of Walter Hood to commemorate and integrate the long and complex history of People's Park as a defining feature of the development, I cannot in any way, shape or form support a 16 story structure inserted into an already dense urban environment composed predominantly of single family dwellings, shops, restaurants, and student living accommodations. The dormitory complexes on Dwight at College, Durant at College, and Durant at Telegraph are prime examples of buildings already out of scale with their environments. Therefore, I urge the Chancellor and the Planning Department to reimagine the height of the project in order to enhance rather than just to destroy what is left of the already affronted neighbor, neighboring dwellings and surrounding fragile neighborhoods. Comment 25 from Jessica McGinley. Graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley, studying society and environment, I have many problems with development on People's Park. My first concern is the supportive housing that keeps being used as an avenue to excuse the displacement of current residents of the park. And the second open house, I asked RCD about the supportive housing, and they said that they are applying for financial support from the government to hopefully get a fraction of the housing, supportive housing which they did not seem to hope for. So supportive housing is only part of the plan and it is not even guaranteed. However, the university keeps publishing documents saying that there will be supportive housing. The university needs to be transparent and honest with the affordable housing development. Supportive housing does not equal affordable housing. Also, even if the developers did get the support to build some of the supportive housing, I asked them if homeless individuals with little to no income would be able to even just apply to live there and RCD said no. This is unacceptable and the university can't keep using this live supportive housing, acting as though the homeless people in the park will be housed. I would also like to see a list of the 200 plus meetings events that were held as stated in the published NLP. I have only been aware of two public open houses this semester, not including the virtual open house in April. I would like to see a list of these meetings, including dates, locations, and where these meetings were publicized for the public's knowledge. Also, the NOP states that the university engages stakeholders, as the university engaged the homeless individuals currently residing in the park. These individuals need to be directly included in these discussions as they would be immediately displaced. I would like to see more involvement with the Berkeley community and students in discussions about the development. I strongly urge the university to consider building on land that does not contribute to food insecurity, displacement, the destruction of green space, the elimination of community gatherings, the demolition of a beautiful community garden and numerous other problems. Please look at building on other sites such as Clark Kerr, which I know has some obstacles, but it will not destroy a beautiful green park that has so much history and provides so much for the Berkeley community. Comment 26, Samuel Siegel. The proposed 16-story tower would figuratively and literally overshadow several recognized landmarks in the immediate vicinity, including the Anna Head School, First Church of Christ Baptist, Baptist Divinity School, and many historic residences. People's Park needs to be developed and returned to its original role as housing, but in a decidedly urbanist way that respects the scale and appearance of the surrounding historic built environment. Additionally, from my experience in criminal justice, history, and urban design, I believe the current proposal contains elements that could pose a risk to public safety, particularly the open spaces secluded from the street and the covered space beneath the architectural breezeway. Comment 27, Sue Fernstorm, too big, does not fit in with the neighborhood. Number 28, Maxina Ventura on behalf of the People's Party Committee. One, LRDP update must not be a programmatic EIR 
that automatically gives the green light into future projects not explicitly listed in the EIR. All future projects mu must continue to be subject to public input under CEQA. Two, the NOP claims 200 meetings and events with stakeholder groups and the public, but not all stakeholders were contacted. Houseless work weren't included. There was a January 24th, 2020 invitation only meeting at the Christian, Christian Science Church by the park. Little effort was made to invite community groups like the People's Park Committee, Food Not Bombs, Suitcase Clinic, or others who provide resources at the park, so few of the park community were able to participate. Except one town hall in the LRDP in April 2019, no public meetings about this process were held. Two public meetings in February and March 2020 were limited to project number two at People's Park, and it didn't include other plans to be discussed, discussed in this EIR. Which stakeholders were invited to the other 196 meetings and what parts of the LRDP update did they cover? Three, the NOP insists on necessity of expansion of facilities and university population, even though Berkeley has sued UC for exceeding the agreed upon number of students to be admitted. The number of beds planned for students and non-university affiliated people are vague, talking about construction up to a certain number without any minimum commitment. No mention of students who are homeless now in need of housing, let alone non-university park residents. And no specifics about nonprofits who are supposed to develop and manage the housing projects proposed at People's Park. Who are these nonprofits? What is their proposed role? And what financial and other benefits would they derive from this project? Four, UC used the excuse of deferred maintenance, a concept mentioned in the NOP, to destroy the forested area of People's Park as well as trees all over campus, and the excuse of wildfire management to deforest other areas in the East Bay Hills and pesticides long targeting the Hill Campus area. Even mature tall redwoods are planned for demolition by UC in the Hill Campus. UC repeatedly has been taken to court by community members seeking to defend the Hill Campus forest. UC insists that since these forested areas are not state or federal forest, it's not necessary to discuss the impact of converting that forest to non-forest use. And because there may not be a formal habitat conservation plan, no habitat conservation activities are necessary in the project areas covered in the EIR, even though many animals, including falcons and hawks, utilize them as habitat. Five, the EIR is supposed to cover historic resources and preserve historic legacy. And as such, People's Park, a city of Berkeley historic landmark, must be preserved as a park, not replaced with buildings. The NOP refers to multi-purpose spaces but People's Park already has multiple purposes and uses for humans and wildlife, which these plans would eliminate. Number 29, Ann Arnold. I live one block away on Walnut Street from the Gateway site, also known locally as the Oxford Tract. The idea of adding accommodation for 850 more students to our relatively quiet neighborhood is horrendous. When the university last became involved in our neighborhood, they constructed an office building at the end of Walnut Street claiming that the plot next to it would be a park. Early after constructing the building, the university turned the lot next to it into a parking lot, and shortly after that, they turned the parking lot into another tall office building, creating a wind tunnel. The Oxford Tract is one of the few open spaces in Berkeley. The research carried out in the greenhouses and in sectory are significant, and the ease of access for students using those facilities is an important element in the success of research being done there. To put 850 people with event space, shops, and office space on such a small piece of land would not be in keeping with the scale of the neighborhood, not to mention the peace and quiet we have previously enjoyed. I see no mention of parking. Is everyone living or working there going to walk or ride bicycles at all times? Surely there are better sites for housing development in Berkeley. Number 30, Julia Sherman. I am strongly against the development of People's Park. This is not a viable solution to the limited number of beds available for students at UC Berkeley. 
Development of this historical landmark will not only put increasing strain on the current housing and dining facilities used on campus, it will further entrench the city of Berkeley in issues related to gentrification, displacement of homeless people, inequity, reduced green open spaces, and more. The destruction of a place that speaks to the values of Berkeley's past should not be used as an opportunity for the university to profit from the admittance of larger freshman classes. People's Park is and should be for the people. It is not acceptable for the university to continue to take uh, from vulnerable local populations. Reminder that People's Park already exists on stolen Ohlone land and profit from development that regresses the sustainable and equitable vision the school currently boasts. While this may be a beneficial decision for the school's wallet, it is not beneficial to the surrounding community or in line with the values of the university's claims to be built on. Please consider the gravity of this decision in oppressing Berkeley's most underserved populations and showcasing the true motives of the university's administration. 31, Lila Moncharsh. The proposed project will hopefully benefit the university and the community. There are many different stakeholders with a project of this complexity. The AIR should evaluate the proposed enrollment increase as it is reasonably likely to negatively impact the availability of critical city services such as fire response to wildfires, evacuations, police availability, and the like. This is a physical, not funding issue under CEQA. The mayor will show that the proposed additional UC enrollment will push the available city services over the tipping point, even if the EIR only considers a baseline number. It should discuss the impact with and without a baseline limit. The EIR should propose mitigations. Under alternatives, the EIR should consider whether future student housing can be constructed further away from the campus where there is ample public transportation. That would reduce the need to evacuate such a tightly compacted area of Berkeley where the bulk of the housing is now located and possibly reduce some of the load on city services, especially emergency services. Is the city sewer system directly around the campus able to adequately handle the current proposed enrollment increase? The EIR should indicate the condition of the Radcliffe design 1930 UC garage park and under alternatives consider whether the 800 plus beds could be moved into the People's Park location with the landmark garage repurposed for the non-residential piece of the project now slated for People's Park. The lot size and the housing piece at the garage site are too small at this location to provide sufficient housing. As is, the proposed People's Park piece provides insufficient housing given the great need. There was a leak from the garage tanks in 1988. Holes were observed in more than one tank. See Enviro store. The AR should discuss whether the remediation that was completed over the years is adequate for residential uses versus the current garage use. Under aesthetics, the EIR should discuss whether the People's Park Project's design, cold institutional buildings in the style sometimes derogatorily called stack and pack should not be located across the street from extant structures some of which are landmarked. Can someone something be done with landscaping to cover their, cover or improve the view into People's Park site? Some of the proposed landscaping now located inside the site be relocated to the outside of the site? Of course, maintenance also will need to be provided before any landscaping. The height of buildings is an aesthetic consideration. The EIR should discuss whether the proposed stepping down will be successful. If not, what alternatives reduce the negative visual impact on surrounding structures? 32, Chase Fenton and Paul Skillbeck. Please be sensible and drop the high-rise plans. People prefer not to live in high-rise buildings. Low-rise alternatives are available. There is a valid future-proof alternative to planning for a concrete jungle. Yes, a concrete jungle and all the social problems that entails. We should all know that the proposed developments are only the precursor of a much darker future. Distance learning, this is the bright alternative. It has proven financially successful it provides successful education and work placement outcomes. In short, it works. And unlike the proposed building plans, it won't spoil Berkeley. Berkeley is a quiet city with distinct and attractive character. Don't let conservative views about education spoil the best of Berkeley. And traffic. Responsible cities are looking at ways to reduce automobile traffic, not to increase it. UC's development plans will lead to a steep increase in Uber and Lyft vehicles speeding through the surrounding neighborhoods. An increase has already been noted in the past two years in Southside and Lacombe. Formal efforts are already underway with the city to protect the neighbor, 
with residents from this new menace. Think about the environment in this impact review. Let's plan responsibly for a better and brighter future, not for darkness and discontent. 33, Lisa Teague. Why save People's Park? Here are the words of Julia Vinogrand, 1943 to 2018, poet laureate of People's Park. People's Park, we will defend this place till the last, last drop of beer and the first drop of rain. People's Park, the wizards and old tales used to bury their hearts in secret places. And unless you dug up the heart and destroyed it, they were invulnerable and heartless. Part of my heart is buried in People's Park. Not all of it, not even the largest part. Other places, people, and I'm no wizard, so I keep some of it myself. Part of my heart is buried in People's Park. Leave it alone. It's the part that will never be reasonable, never grow old, and know better and do worse. It's young. Breathing is sweet to it and wild and scary. It remembers me at soldiers bayonets with daffodils. It remembers tear gas drifting over swing sets. It will always be young. Leave it alone. I go to the park sometimes to talk to it. Not often. Time passes and it doesn't always recognize me, but it tells me there are many hearts buried with it. All young, all proud of what they made and fought for. Do not disturb them. Do not build on them. Do not explain that times have changed. Do not tell them it's for their own good. They've heard that before. They will not believe you. There are many hearts buried in People's Park and part of my own as well. Oh, leave them alone. This is People's Park where tattooed fighters planted rose tattoos and roses glue and roses grew blood red. It's not a peaceful place. The vines are tangled with our nerves. <clears throat> Grass untidy as a drunk's beard. Trees grow shopping carts. Bushes grow sleeping bags. Lilies of the valley smoke cigarettes. They just bummed, but with such style. <clears throat> Here are sunflowers that steal your backpack when you're not looking. Daisies crooked as game booths at the circus and violets sticking out. They're impotent purple tongues. Or is that us? I don't know, it doesn't matter. When people come to Berkeley, they always ask to see People's Park. And when I show, when I show it to them, they don't see it. Next time, I'm not going to walk them a few blocks watch their faces and try to explain. Instead, I'll show them my hands. Here's, peace, here's People's Park, I'll say, here. Comment 34 from Clifford Fred. It is very disrespectful to the citizens of Berkeley for UCB to only schedule two hours for the EIR scoping session on April 27, with much of that time taking up with UCB presentations and little time left for questions and comments from the public. It is very disrespectful to the citizens of Berkeley for UCB to insist with going ahead with an online scoping session and not waiting for the coronavirus pandemic to end so that public scoping session can be held as normally would occur. Many people who would otherwise want to participate might be ill with the coronavirus or taking care of someone who is. I, along with many civic organizations and citizens of Berkeley, ask the university <coughs> delay the EIR scoping session and the notice of preparation until the COVID-19 pandemic is over and the EIR scoping session can be held in public with members of the public attending. I urge the University of California Berkeley campus to impose an immediate freeze on any increase in student enrollment and an immediate moratorium on all of its development projects in the city of Berkeley until a new UCB long range development plan has been prepared and adopted. UCB's current enrollment is about 10,000 more than the maximum allowed in the UCB LRDP now in effect. And any additional UCB development and or increase enrollment or enrollment increase would only exacerbate that violation. UCB's reckless over enrollment is the main cause of the city of Berkeley's homeless situation. Lack of affordable housing, gridlock traffic, poor air quality, lack of open space, excessive noise levels, lack of businesses offering basic services to Berkeley's long-term residents and is also the main cause for a dramatic decline in civility in Berkeley and increased hostility to older Berkeley residents. Project alternatives. A draft EIR must describe a range of reasonable alternatives to the proposed project or to its location that could feasibly attain the project's basic objective and must evaluate the comparative merits of each alternative. The discussion must focus on alternatives capable of either eliminating any significant adverse environmental effects 
or reducing them to a level of insignificance, even if such alternatives would be more costly or to some degree would impede the uh, project's progress. If the lead agency prefers the project as specifically proposed or one of these suggested alternatives, the EIR must explain why the agency chooses to reject the other alternatives. The EIR should examine three or more alternative plans, giving each plan equal weight. The EIR preparation, review, and revision process should then be used to arrive at a preferred alternative plan. The first project alternative analyzed should immediately freeze the current level of enrollment at UCB and steadily reduce enrollment to no more than the maximum allowed in the UCB long range development plan that was in effect prior to the adoption of the long range development plan that is now in effect. In this plan, People's Park in its, entirely, in its entirety would remain as public open. The remainder of the comment exceeds uh, 500 words uh, here and the limit for the scoping session. Uh, however, the full comment will be incorporated into the EIR. Comment 35 from Ursula, Ursula Schwartz. Regarding the UCB, UC Berkeley LRDP, I am objecting to the increased size of the projected number of students and faculty and the university's unilateral style of engagement with their surrounding community. There are other less well UC campuses that could absorb those numbers better than Berkeley. I am particularly aghast at the proposal of including the Oxford tract as a future development that could house upwards of 3,000 students. I live near the Oxford tract on Walnut Street. Funneling a large amount of additional people to our already dense block will be astonishingly destructive of the environment, infrastructure, and quiet ambience of the neighborhood. It is vital open space as well as a location of scientific inquiry. Indeed, any building on this space should be disallowed. The agricultural studies that take place on the Oxford track are the connection to the original land grant that supported the founding of UC. The proximity of the experiments to the campus are exactly what the administration envisioned when they purchased the land after the first huge Berkeley fire in the 1920s. I was told that the original owners of the properties were assured that this land would never be built on. The encroachment of buildings on this experimental agricultural space has been an object of the university administration for some time. I attended hearings regarding the building at Oxford and Hearst Street. Promises of well-tended landscaping and responsibility to the neighborhood were never fulfilled. It is and always has it is and has always been a track through an eyesore. I would like to point out that the removal of Tolman Hall has left plenty of space to install dorms, not to mention the Chancellor's Garden is conveniently placed on the campus proper. I'm very supportive of housing students. It is specious to claim that UC is addressing this issue while radically adding to the population of the campus, creating more slots of creating more slots on campus is not going to be the solution to the issue, especially as expensive dorms managed by for-profit companies will be operating the structure profit-making investment. The insistence on holding this important meeting during the COVID-19 pandemic seems poorly, uh, poorly thought through. Comment 36 from Eden Hill. I am the vice chair of the City of Berkeley Homelessness Commission a UC Berkeley student, and a Berkeley mayoral candidate for this 2020 election. I'm speaking as an individual, not on behalf of or constituency. I am disappointed this virtual open house has not addressed my concerns. What is the estimated cost per semester for housing? How will an altered landscape change soil quality? Will the university explicitly state priority housing for People's Park residents is illegal? This process attempting to develop my neighborhood park continues to marginalize students and homeless people alike. UC's development process burdens park residents with enormous stress. Continued threats after curfew raids and public health failures prove UC Berkeley administrators have no intention to steward people's park by its own community standards. Does our university truly wish to ease a living, to erase a living monument 
and displace us from our open community space by continuing to violate the trust of environmentalists, children, students, women, and people of color, both undocumented and unhoused. UC administrators inspire no confidence in protecting its constituents from the foreseeable climate crisis. My primary object objection to building on People's Park is climate adaption and mitigation. People's Park provides temporary refuge space for students living in Martinez Commons and Unit 2 during emergencies. The park's ecology provides clean air and soil health for our Southside community. Please note the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate stated they encourage universities around the world to address climate change as a core part of their mission. This is incompatible with building on People's Park, the only open space accessible to me and my family on Telegraph Ave and the White Way. People's Park Committee has noted several alternative locations for housing students, including University House or Clark Kirk Campus. Every park resident I have talked to is unanimous there should be no housing development on People's Park. Please note, California's fourth climate change assessment states, people who are already vulnerable, including low income and other marginalized communities, have a lower capacity to prepare for and cope with extreme weather and climate related events. Prioritizing adaptation actions for the most vulnerable populations would contribute to a more fair future within our Berkeley community. Colleagues, please refrain from climate denial by acknowledging that People's Park is an ecological sanctuary and a living monument to the free speech movement and our Southside community. I welcome students conducting field research for public health, ecology, equity at People's Park. Development, however, is ill-advised. As a People's Park steward, I will continue to protect the civil rights environment and student leadership embedded in consciousness within our park. Number 37, Rachel McGinley. I think that it is wrong and unethical for the university to continue with this public comment period during a pandemic and shelter in place order. People have many things to worry about right now, such as their health, families, children, grandparents, financial insecurity, and so much more. And the university is taking advantage of these, this critical time to push forward their agendas without transparency or adequate communication. Even the mayor of Berkeley, Jesse R. Green, personally asked Carol Chris to, po to postpone this public comment period until after the shelter in place order has been done. It is absolutely appalling that the university would uphold this brief public comment period during a global crisis. Number 38, Isis Farrow. LRDP updates described in the NOP consist of projects opposed by local residents. The EIR is declared programmatic, a bureaucratic maneuver to avoid CEQA compliance and public involvement on future projects and enable future further encroachment of UC facilities on unwilling communities. Future projects must produce their own EIR and include public input. I oppose expansion of UC Berkeley, its history of taking over surrounding towns, burdening local infrastructure. The increase of the university population violates agreements with the city of Berkeley. Long-term residents are being displaced with even UC students homeless, neglected by an overpriced, overcrowded public university. This proposal is not an effort to find solutions for existing housing problems, but to expand the university and bring in more students, further compounding the problem. UC has repeatedly shown it won't let environmental laws get in the way of expansion and is determined to kill every tree in its path. The Hill Campus this EIR targets was one of several agencies project already reviewed in FEMA's East Bay Hills EIS, which together would have destroyed half a million trees on thousands of acres on University, Park District, and Oakland land. Under the guise of fire hazard mitigation, UC attempted to appropriate public emergency funds for the same development scheme proposed here. In 2014, before the EIS finished reviewing the project, UC illegally clear-cut Frowning Ridge, another of the proposals to FEMA. Proposals to FEMA. In 2016, UC's projects, including Hill Campus, were stopped in court by Hill's residents 
as was the addendum to the previous LRDP EIR with which UC tried to sneak the project past CEQA. Even the timing of this NOP compromises the usual public process and public comment should be extended after the shelter in place order is lifted. UC claims 200 meetings with stakeholders, but people most directly affected by these proposals were not included. People's Park would have been an ideal venue to communicate with the community there, but the university treats the park with disdain, neglecting maintenance of bathrooms, even now in this public health crisis, and two years ago without warning, killed dozens of trees, robbing the park of its, its extensive forest of cooling shade, which provided habitat to human neighbors and wildlife alike. People's Park is where community gathers for events, where people who lack housing and struggle for survival can take a rest, where activists share food and life-saving resources and tend the soil and grow a garden, services worth more than the de development proposed. I oppose any increase in university population and expansion by UC Berkeley, including removing trees from Hill Campus. I warn policymakers that attempts to develop People's Park would certainly be met with resistance, like all previous attempts over the last 51 years. Those killed and injured by police violence against those that defended the park as our public commons are not properly honored by symbolic memorials, but require that People's Park once and for all be declared a protected historical landmark that belongs to the community, not the university. Number 40, Marguerite Tompkins. I am a loyal UC Berkeley alumna and grateful donor. I am also a Berkeley resident. This community is blessed with extraordinary architectural, architectural treasures and the first Church of Christ scientist, Bernard Maybeck's masterpiece, may be the most precious of them. I am writing to express my profound distress with the plan to erect a 16-story tower in the proposed location. I am well aware of the challenge that the university faces to provide student housing, but it should not do so at the cost of degrading a structure that is part of our cultural patrimony. Surely the university has the ability to find solutions that meet its current needs while safeguarding for future generations what is truly irreplaceable. 41, Megan March. I'm a longtime Berkeley resident, 15 years, located on Blake Street between Dana and Ellsworth. As a family and my partner and I work in the arts education. I'm writing to you today with my concerns with the LRDP and the desire to build high rise housing off campus as a concerned resident and as a member of the Blake Street Neighbors Group. Given the current circumstances with COVID-19, it may be a time to consider the role student housing plays in Berkeley. Questions of affordability and neighborhood impact for current and future residents are also a concern. We want to encourage people to love Berkeley enough to care about their community. Don't take away the reasons why people like the present and future residents. Why not have more student housing and more affordable outlying areas near BART, transit, such as El Cerrito, et cetera? With the future push for distance living, will this much expensive housing be necessary? High rise buildings, community buildings. Please consider low rise buildings for quality of life of building residents and to maintain neighborhood character. If current development models are there will be no guarantee in ground floor retail that will benefit the community. We don't need more private gyms or vacant space used as a tax write off for landlords. This will put added pressures on neighborhood infrastructure, including utilities, parking, and traffic. How will this be mitigated? We're already packed and are currently pleading with the city of Berkeley for help with traffic and parking issues, which we still haven't gotten after, we still haven't gotten after 10 plus years of trying. So the community have that these units will be afforded rented out. None of these units are rent controlled. And there is no accountability with regards to occupancy rates. Buildings should be required to have zero occupancy rate. Off campus housing built specifically for students is housing discrimination, period. 42, Paula Gloria Barton. As an Anna alumni, as an Anna Head alumni who started her school day with a short 15 minute entire school auditorium, now called Alumni Hall, around six, 1961 to 63, I protest the people's part with more gigantic dormitories that look like prisons. At a time when so much education is going online, there is no reason to destroy the historic landmarks view doing by a world that appreciates culture and art. Out of, control, out of control real estate investment should never destroy the wealth 
being in legacy of the communities they are building in, even when they are disguised as educational or somehow essential for the people. Do not destroy the values of Berkeley's legacy by going forward with this project. People's Park will no longer be the People's Park. 43, Harry Smith, on behalf of People's Park Historic District Advocacy Group. I represent a nonprofit organization, the People's Park Historic District Advocacy Group, organized to protect, preserve, and enhance public understanding of the significant architectural and cultural landmarks, historic events unique to the Southside campus area through outreach, education, and cultural community projects. My comments are addressed prim primarily to the housing number two project. First, we want to point out that this online public session is inappropriate given the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. The timelines for the EIR process should be extended to allow adequate, truly public input. Second, the LRDP and two housing projects should not be combined in, in one EIR when there are three distinct projects occurring in different locations in Berkeley. Third, the EIR does not offer a no-build alternative. Fourth, the pandemic crisis will surely impact many aspects of planning for the city, the university, and the nation, including the economy, budgetary resources, and student enrollment. It will not be business as usual in the future. Our specific objections and concerns regarding environmental impact are the following. This project will have a significant effect on the aesthetics of the area by substantially degrading and obstructing publicly accessible views and the existing visual character of the area resulting in a substantial demonstrable negative aesthetic effect. It will have an adverse effect on the cultural and historic resources by the demolition, destruction, and alteration of the existing historic character of the park and its surrounding reg registered historic landmarks. The hydrology and water quality of the People's Park site is not addressed. Land use and planning are not adequately assessed because the city of Berkeley has not completed its south side plan. The adverse impact on the existing character of the vicinity is not considered. And the project ignores the Berkeley Public Parks and Open Space Preservation Ordinance of 1986. Population and housing are major issues in Berkeley, but while future projections can be difficult, UC has disregarded even its own plans and over-enrolled. No adequate assessment of the additional demand of public services is given, or the effect of the elimination of open space, particularly its loss as a safe shelter in a highly, seismic, highly seismically active area. The reduction of the recreation space is the most in the most densely populated area of Berkeley is not adequately addressed. <clears throat> the university has long considered People's Park a liability. We contend that the People's Park Historic District is a community asset that should be developed through grassroots <laughs> community-based user-developed initiative. A fuller ex explication of our concerns and our objections and a no-build alternative that would recognize the architectural, cultural, and historic contributions of the park in the Southside neighborhood will be presented by us by the May 15th deadline. Comment 44, uh, Michaela Tran. I oppose the development of People's Park. The plans to build student housing through a number of sustainable practices represent stark efforts to greenwash the space and blatantly disregard the social, political, and economic consequences this narrow interpretation of, of this narrow interpretation of sustainability. The project will only solidify UC control over these vital public spaces, this places the most vulnerable members of our community and put increasing strains on our current housing and dining facilities. As the largest employer in California, UC actively contributes to the market conditions that produce the social issues of housing and homelessness that it seeks to address through development. These are problems that cannot be solved by the construction of a simple housing complex, and such development will only worsen and allow the same conditions to continue that result in even more homelessness and crime. For these reasons and more, I oppose the development of People's Park. Comment 45, Terry Compost. I must begin by pointing out that the space and resources of the city of Berkeley and the UC campus are obviously not infinite and that the current housing crisis is being manufactured by UC's decision to radically increase the student load far beyond any of their previous plans or predictions. This increase appears to be a devious business move where UC creates an extreme demand for housing and then begs permission to build so they can then cash in on their housing crisis. UC should continue educating a reasonably sized population of students 
remaining in the business of education rather than real estate. Next, I would like to point out why their excessive building plan on People's Park is unacceptable. First, UC and the City of Berkeley committed to retain People's Park as open space. Open space means no buildings on the park. An important reason that the park remain open green space is that, the desperately, that, is that it is desperately needed in that neighborhood of extremely dense population. If there was an earthquake or other emergency, open space is the safe place where people would go to, to share information, resources, and avoid immediate danger. As the recent academic has shown, having, little, having a little space can be crucial to people's uh, safety. The park also offers very important psychological and physical health amenities. It absorbs water and carbon dioxide and provides oxygen a taste of nature and habitat for animal species. It is a psychological relief neighborhood offering respite, calmness, space, and peace to all kinds of people in need. While a certain amount of the social chaos it absorbs is not always pretty, it is frightening to imagine what would happen without this place of healing. The park is the heart of Berkeley's history. It exists in the soil and space where people gather in the trees and plants and structures built by volunteers. It is uniquely created by user development. It is the place where we celebrate and mourn together. It cannot be replaced by a plaque. People's Park can be said to have had more attention, discussion, volunteer labor, and love poured into it than any other place in Berkeley. There are untold stories and ghosts there. I will not roll over and let some architectural plan be erected. It will, it will rebel. To try, to try it will, will rend our community. We need the park. We need the open space. It is not the place to build a high rise. Do not build on people's park. Comment 46 from how why the right. Public comments are public comments are presently limited to choices made under parameters that were already determined. However, it is the parameters that are really important here. The public should be able to have input on the parameters, such as the height, size, and density of the buildings. Please find a way to allow for public comment and input on them. Number 47, Sheila Mitra Sarkar. People's Park was created in 1969. This park is City of Berkeley's first green infrastructure to sustain Derby and Potter watershed. Over the past five decades, People's Park has provided considerable financial and water quality gains to the city by reducing and managing stormwater. The park mimics natural hydrologic functions to prevent stormwater overburdening the sewer systems. It is one of the oldest and cost effective way to supplement or replace gray infrastructure. The housing project design was conducted in a pre-pandemic environment when the gentrification design language to pave over green areas, such as crime, unsafe, and dangerous, often cited by administrators, politicians, and consultants, was still acceptable. Urban designers and architects were still allowed to gloss over the harmful effects of gentrification by offering terms, unified space, overlook, commemorative plaque, patios for passive recreation. Fortunately, activists and, academic, activists and academicians are developing a new collaborative field that will put an end to blatant and fatal mistakes of paving over green areas as social distancing and open spaces become integral uh, part of our survival. Don't forget that we are still in the midst of the pandemic and the experts are concerned about the spread of the disease. Michael Stoto, a, prof a professor of population health at Georgetown University shared, three variables dictate the spread of a disease. How many people the average person encounters in a day when transmission could take place, whether through face-to-face -face interaction or from touching the same surface, the chance that the virus will be transmitted in each of those interactions, and the proportion of people that you encounter who are themselves these population health scenarios affect housing and open space designs. Two months ago, designers had no idea about how infection rate increases with exposure density. The risk of infection is a function of being close to people who are infected. The rise of infection can be expected to be higher where there are very high micro densities 
whether in residences, transport, or employment in education locations. Fatal errors. A, a 16-story building would violate legibility, structure, and identity. B, furthermore, students who will live in these high-rise residential buildings are likely to exp experience greater exposure densities. C, buildings of such scale will require air conditioning, which increases the spread of the virus. D, the high density and 16 story buildings will exacerbate the street canyon. Street canyons increase pollution. Coronavirus has been detected on particles of air pollution. The value of this park is even greater now for the city and the communities. It's a living park with history that is helping many who cannot walk too far their daily dose of UV and nature. The UC Berkeley's proposal on People's Park is considered a taking of, of a public good while exacerbating pandemic urban microdensity. Number 48, Ivar Deal and Siobhan Letow. The environmental impact of the development proposal at People's Park will be of a manifold nature. First, the damage to the historical integrity of both Berkeley and UC would be impossible to mitigate. There is no way that the small and heavily uh, mediated space that would be left on the site could honor the struggle, pain, and death that was inflicted on the Berkeley community by UC Berkeley and the state of California. This very painful and contentious legacy of state and institutional violence necessitates that any plan for People's Park not disrespect the culture of the park users, either in fact or in apparent effect. The mayor of the city of Berkeley has requested that UC Capital Strategy delay and or prolong the window for public comment on NOP and EIR until the lift of COVID quarantine, likely in June. This is not a lot to ask, and if UC refuses to honor this request, the process will be tainted, voiding any legitimacy of the development proposal at People's Park. The tight EIR schedule that UC is imposing during a worldwide pandemic is also concerning in light of a total lack of interior plans being released for any of the proposed developments, including at the People's Park site. We are concerned that those floor plans may not be appropriate in a world newly threatened by coronavirus and other infectious outbreaks. The air handling and climate control are also a concern. How much potential will there be for exchanges of spores and aerosols from one residential unit to another? Will the kitchen and living rooms be shared? The cost of the units is also important. The mitigation of the housing crisis will be much less if the units are expensive. The services that People's Park currently offers to Berkeley and visitors are not being replaced by this development, either directly or through an offset. The city and those who pay taxes to the city will be forced to shoulder the financial burden incurred by destroying this park, which is so pre precious to so many. Willard Park gets quite crowded and People's Park is the only other green space on Southside campus that has all the utility and flexibility of a city park. The UC campus green space cannot be purposed for the city, by the city for disaster mitigation, for instance. The proposed development can be built at a nearby and much less contentious location, Clark Kirk Campus, 133 acres jointly owned by both UC and City of Berkeley. The Clark Kerr site is ideal for solving the enrollment overruns mandated by UC Regents. Number 49, Robert Fisher. I comment on the following, following environmental issue areas. One, aesthetics, two, quality, three, biological resources, four, cultural resources, five, recreation. One, the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association makes a compelling presentation that because of the concentration of historic landmarks of merit, the park and surrounding area should be recognized as a de facto historic district. Two, the importance of trees, bushes, and open space cannot be underestimated in their contribution to air quality, especially in urban areas. Three, the neighborhood use of the park as a community garden is a significant biological resource. Four, this plot of land, although owned by the university, represents the social movements of the 1960s. The struggles to save the park from overdevelopment have become a momentous cultural and educational resource and should be honored and treated with respect similar to the free speech movement. 
Five, this park is a classic green space that provides very recreational opportunities. There's a grove of trees to walk through, grassy areas and courts where numerous games are played, and park benches that offer a place to sit and observe to and reflect. 50, Andrea Pritchett. I graduated from UC Berkeley in 1985 and I've lived in Berkeley for over 42 years. I've been witness to events in People's Park and lived on Telegraph Avenue for most of that time. I'm currently a history teacher at Willard Middle School and I confess that I am partial to those things which are historic. I believe that our community and our society becomes aimless and valueless when we casually disregard the lessons of history and its artifacts. People's Park is a living thread of history that connects us not only to the desire for true freedom and the love of creativity that characterized the movements of the time, it connects us to the earth, to heal, to the health of our community, to acts of great kindness and generosity, as well as cruelty and desperation. Whatever People's Park is now, it is, in some way, in the measure of all of us. There are those who use the park and those who abuse it, those who offer help and those who blame and accuse. Today, the poverty that has made People's Park the last refuge for those in need for decades now threatens to engulf more, more and more of us. People's Park is more needed now than, <clears throat> than ever. Unless you plan to expand on your current policy of hiding, harassing, and ignoring people in poverty who suffer at your doorstep, we implore you to leave the park alone and let it continue to build on its 50-year history of offering space for those with nothing to come, for those with nothing to come seek food, support, free expression, and connection. We invite anyone who truly wants to serve the poorest among us to join us now. Sadly, the UC has answered the calls for help with a deaf ear. Now, after decades of neglect, a social worker has finally been hired, one. This is compared to the legions of police who have cited, berated, and abused those folks over the years. It's hard to imagine that UC could be so heartless that you would, have, you would pave over the cultural, historical, and community needs of our community so you can build overpriced housing for people who have never even been to Berkeley. That you would place a food mart on the place where our history and even our future lies is an offense that cannot be measured. I'm here to raise my voice in opposition to your plan to build housing on People's Park. I believe that we need to offer love and support to those who need the park and offer the park to all our community. We need UC to stop expanding housing for students at the expense of the people who live and work and love Berkeley. 51, Melinda Lopez. After reviewing your future development plans in a 50-year Berkeley native resident residing in North Berkeley within a stone's throw of Project One, I am concerned. One, the assumption indicates that the institution needs to prepare for a growth estimate of 11,000 additional students for the 2036 37 academic year. Your, your desired future encroachment through Berkeley doesn't take into consideration the current existing populations who are being squeezed out of their pricey and nature in the areas. Sorry, they are being squeezed out of their privacy and nature in the areas. For example, project number one assumes that 850 undergraduate students are free to park, make noise, have soirees of beer drinking, and loud music and rage parties that are already existing in shared housing in our neighborhoods. The notion of having these large populations of students without issues in a pipe dream is a pipe dream in that your assumption is that they will hermetically they will be hermetically sealed and on their best behavior. These activities of this new population will be magnified exponentially by 10 times. Two, one thing that this pandemic has taught us is that the shelter in place that online learning technologies have picked up more than enough of the slack from the loss of physical campus learning. It is my contention that to solve the growth problem facing the UCB system over the coming decades does not reside in the order growth only solution. Rather, it should be considered that online technologies, especially in the coming years, represents a blended solution, thereby relieving the pressure of encroaching, encroaching into neighborhoods such as mine. Example, would a Zoom meeting be a better experience than 700 students in a lecture hall where you can barely hear or see the professor? Three, in addition to an environmental impact statement, have you addressed the upcoming student educational planning of diverse subjects that are not offered at UCB? I graduated from UCLA versus UCB as it didn't offer the culturally diverse educational needs at the time. Four, we explored other areas of large land to be developed outside the city of Berkeley to create more UC campuses 
as you see, is a statewide system, not just exclusive to Berkeley, only as this plan envisions. In closing, I ask that when, when is enough growth enough? When the best academic minds surely, with the best academic minds surely, you must agree that blended solution of technology, i.e. Zoom, in light brick and mortar going forward can play a meaningful role in your expansion challenges. 52, Michael Katz. My lifetime Cal Alumni Association membership reflects my enduring gratitude for the excellent affordable graduate education I received at Cal. I wish I could replace corresponding confidence in this great learning institution's ability to learn from evidence and from its own past errors. In a changed world of global pandemics and physical distancing, Cal Cal's proposed 16 and 11 story towers on People's Park are simply insane. As New, as New York City's catastrophic rates of infection and death demonstrate, high density buildings with elevator only access rapidly spread conta contagious diseases. One block Cal's recent Anna Head dorms provide 424 units in low rise buildings accessible by multiple stairways. For People's Park, Cal's architect offered a similar low rise point eight spoke layout, but rather than replicate success, Cal arrogantly proposes structures impossible to finance and unsafe to occupy. This is a super, this is as super stupid as the supersized athletic facility that Cal did right on the Hayward Fall, a deficit plagued white elephant that will drain the campus budget for at least a century. At the Upper Hill Project in Oxford Track, Cal threatens more oversized megastructures that would degrade livability for its own community. The Tolman Hall and 2223 Fulton Street demolitions offer space for high capacity on-campus student housing. Yet Cal arbitrarily refuses to build any housing on its main campus. If dorms are good enough for Harvard Yard, why not for Cal? This campus's fundamental problem is addiction to growth and enslavement to a model from a bygone century. Cal's current population of 39,708 already exceeds its 2020 LRD commitment by 19%, 6,258 people, leading to loss for uncompensated impacts on the city. For 2033, Cal proposes to supersize its 2020 target by astounding 44%. Clark Kerr, UC's president during a past rapid expansion, is notorious today for comparing the university to a corporation. Indeed, for-profit corporations must continuously grow to award their shareholders with higher revenues and valuations. But UC is not a nonprofit. Excuse me. But UC is a nonprofit whose shareholders are California taxpayers. And this .org will soon face a yawning funding deficit. If Cal's current leaders want to re retain the public's loyalty and not be remembered as reviled punchlines, they must adapt to the new world of dis di distributed learning. Cal should be aiming to stabilize and reduce, not expand its local population, its physical footprint beyond its central campus and an expensive empire of real estate follies. Cal has successfully moved all instruction online this spring. Its brightest future lies in expanding on this trend of virtual knowledge sharing. UC Berkeley affiliated research and instruction need not all occur in jam expensive Berkeley. It's time for Cal to finally virtually fulfill its promise of extension benefits to residents and taxpayers up and down the state, and to share its research and teaching best practices so that undergraduate degrees from every UC campus, including those with green fields to expand into, carry the same prestige as Cal degrees. Cal's only sustainable future lies in physical contraction and virtual expansion. Please acknowledge this reality. I'd like to acknowledge that we're about eight minutes uh, over our desired end time, but we only have four more comments to read. So I'd like to thank everyone's patience for handing, uh, hanging in with us tonight, especially our IT team that are supporting us. And with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and continue with our last four comments and wrap up soon. Uh, comment 53 comes from Tony Garrett on behalf of the First Church of Christ Scientist Berkeley for, over 50, for our over 50 year history. First Church of Christ Scientist Berkeley has been a cornerstone of the southeast corner of People's Park. We are able to participate in the planning and consideration for the renewal of the park. We are also pleased that the university is taking into serious consideration the public's deep sentiments regarding the values and ideals that the park represents. These being open space for all, community relationship with UC Berkeley, 
and the commercial and residential neighborhood that surrounds it. The current reality is starkly different. It is past due to be repaired and the acreage of the space utilized constructively. However, keep it in proportion, please. The new proposed building plan for People's Park is too big. The height of the proposed buildings is way out of proportion to not only our historic landmark neighborhood, our historic landmark neighborhood, but to the campus as a whole. If you plan need to increase enrollments to the proposed 47,000, perhaps a new adjunct campus would be appropriate rather than the heart of Berkeley. Please cut the heights of the building significantly. The current usage of homeless encampments is sometimes better controlled than at other times, but it is always an issue which curtails general public usage of this park. Development needs to proceed. However, it should be kept in proportion and be a friendly, usable park space. Activity is essential to preempt the currently typical hangout spots. Drug usage and disposed needles and waste are common in the area. Our church building, First Church of Christ Scientist Berkeley is a national historic landmark and an important visitor attraction for Berkeley. Bernard Maybeck designed it in keeping with the historic homes that existed there in 1910. The year round sunlight which filters through the glass into the auditorium is an important feature of the architectural design and is highlighted on the equinox when it precisely shines on the organ loft which illuminates in the building. We trust that the university design team is taking this into consideration and will preserve the light patterns. However, the current proposal for an eight-story building horizontal to about it divides the open space even with the portico concept. The 16-story building is out of scale with all of Berkeley. How does the 16-story building compare to the Campanile? We'd like to suggest that you move the building closer to the west end of the property and the supportive housing building, leaving some open space but placing the majority of the open space together in the view of the streets. The portico is a good critical element in providing both a sense of inclusiveness and expansiveness. We believe this would make it more conductive to attract community usage and supervision. And lastly, there is an underground creek, Derby Creek, which should be taken into consideration. Comment 54 from Joe Leisner. Power to the people. The total and utter destruction of People's Park, a registered historic resource, is defined by section 15064.5 in the CEQA guidelines as a significant environmental impact. The University of California cannot be permitted to find that such an impact is significant and unavoidable. UC must, must show that they have explored in a significant degree possible or feasible alternatives to such destruction. Could anybody with the accumulated power of the regents of the University of California and their clear intention to destroy People's Park the, uh, the second time be expected to honestly explore such alternatives? Why would the regents honestly look for those alternatives if they don't fully understand what they're destroying? At the first open house, UCB presented project number two, Building Over People's Park. Steve Wasserman of Heyday Books, publisher of The Battle for People's Park, Explain to the lead architects that for the project that explain to the lead architects for that project that for any meaningful conversation to begin with park advocates, the university first must apologize for the murder of James Rector, the blinding of Alan Blanchard, and the maiming of 142 other people. Has UCB ever given any indication that they have even heard the many requests for an apology that people have made over the 51 years since those events of May 15, 1969? Wake up, fool. Institutions with the power of the UC don't apologize. They win. I dare say most of us can't imagine or admit the extent of UC's power. UC manages two nuclear weapons design, development, and testing facilities in the US. What are the implications of that? Do regents and trilateral commission meetings, do, sorry, do regents attend trilateral commission meetings? Could the UC's, oper, or could the UC's operation of the anti-Vietnam War movement in the late, op, or, could the UC's oppression of the anti-Vietnam War movement in the late 1960s implicate them in our country's current addiction to endless war? 
Can the UC admit their role in fostering the class division and hatred of Ronald Reagan's march to the presidency and its culmination with the tyrant currently fanning the flames of racial hatred? The destruction of People's Park is UC's attempt to silence those who worked and fought for peace and freedom, those who might still pose these kind of questions or ask UC for an apology. What can UC be inscribed on its walkways in project number two that are offered as a memorial to People's Park that could provide any support or inspiration to future generations of would-be freedom fighters when the UC shows no care or understanding for what they have done. It should become clear that the Board of Regents of the University of California will not seriously or honestly consider alternatives to project number two in this EIR. I hereby ask that in accord with CEQA guidelines, an alternative no-build project be given significant consideration and alternative building sites also be given significant consideration. Comment 55, Lisa Smith. I am commenting about the proposed building on People's Park. I grew up across the bay, but my mom brought me to People's Park when I was a kid. When I was on her boyfriend's shoulders, beholding the park full of people dancing to Commander Cody, it was so magical that I told myself I was gonna hear when I grew up, which I did. As a youth, I had gotten inspired and involved in environmental and social justice issues, so especially excited, excited to come to a place that had such a rich history of act activism. I would say that aside from my learning at the university, that I received most of my education from the community here, from the streets, and specifically from the diverse assembly of committed people who gather in People's Park. To have a special commons where all sorts of people gather, families, longtime residents, homeless students, all colors, genders, styles, ages, etc., was and is a special thing indeed, and an important thing. In the early 90s, the activists had people I connected with become longtime friends and an inspiration for my life. Much of my participation, participation later at the WTO shutdown in Washington, the Occupy movement, specifically in Oakland, the bonds and connection that happen in these moments and places is irreplaceable and inspires people for their entire lifetimes. You can't put a price tag on that and we are losing this history if we destroy such things. It is to make, an, it is to make a better world. In 1991, we started food, East Bay Food Not Bombs and started serving Monday through Friday in People's Park. I worked with the organization for 20 years sharing healthy meals, breaking bread with all sorts of people. Sharing and taking care of each other continues in People's Park every day. Mutual aid. When we lose our gathering places, we lose so much more, and we need to keep this vision, history, community, infrastructure, and connection into the future for the next generations. Number 56, Michael Apte. I am a lifelong resident of Berkeley. My wife and I have lived on Walnut Street between Virginia and Cedar since 1978. I went through the entire 12 grades in the Berkeley school system. I graduated from Berkeley with a BS, MPH, and PhD, and spent almost, almost my entire working career at LBNL. While being very oriented towards UCB, the university's mission and culture, I have never been a fan of the administration's relationship with the city and residents of Berkeley. It has often been a one-way street where the city gives and the university takes. This is no more evident than in the case of housing. Obviously the UCB needs to house its students, but the system as it stands creates a huge power imbalance. Students are admitted and the city has to provide for them. This leads to untenable living conditions where many students are overcharged for substandard rentals and overcrowded shares. The city is beyond capacity for an increase in student enrollment. This is true in terms of actual housing units, but more importantly, in terms of the infrastructure to support those housing units and their residents. Berkeley housing is already among the densest in the US. Given this problem, why is UC planning another expansion in Berkeley? Understandably, UCB is very popular and is the jewel in UC's crown, so there is pressure to bring in increasing numbers of students. It is also clear that increased enrollment is a big money maker for these systems. Having had to raise funding, I understand the financial need for income sources. However, planned expansion pushes more problems onto the city and the local environment. 
there has to be a balance. The LRDP has proposed is once again pushing out into neighborhoods that can ill afford to be to can ill afford the added density. The South Berkeley plans in the current draft LRDP will have a huge impact on the student housing dominated region around People's Park. Parking and traffic are already so congested in this area. Further, I am concerned for the vaguely presented second level plans to build at the Oxford tract. Word has it that there are plans for housing over 4,000 students on that land. The Oxford tract is a special part of UCB, part of the land grant system and gifted to the university after the Berkeley fire. For students, it is an opportunity to connect with agriculture in this overwhelming high tech crowded environment. Uh, for local residents, it is the last buffer against urban expansion that has consumed the neighborhoods in the area. It may not even be legal to repurpose this land, but if the university manages to get permitted to load it with thousands of students, it will cause a lasting negative impact. The first blow took place when UCB constructed the replacement of Warren Hall. UC promised that this wonderful new building would be an asset to the neighborhood. Take a walk around the Oxford tract and see how UC cares for this property. That final comment concludes tonight's online scoping session. Uh, please remember that the deadline to submit comments is May 15, 2020 at five o'clock PM, and that all comments received, whether to be read aloud tonight or in writing by email or US mail before the May 15 deadline will be responded to equally as is required by the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you again for joining us and we hope that you have a